Wars are certainly bloody punctuation marks in history, and the war against first Republican and then Imperial France lasted 22 years. It cost our nation dearly. We lost upwards of a quarter of a million men and women during this conflict, and we had a national debt in old terms of 500 million pounds, and it was a very expensive and traumatic war. But, especially as the Peninsula War started in 1808, things began to improve, lessons had been learned, and the army began to improve gradually, uh, with more lessons being learnt on the battlefield, and of course Wellington, as he became, required a, a, a cadre of um, medical men that had to be as efficient as his fighting soldiers. So that by the end of the Peninsula War in 1814, we had an army medical department of which we could certainly be justly proud. The army medical department provided firstly regimental surgeons who were rather like general practitioners to a battalion with one senior surgeon and two junior assistants. The other was the senior surgeon to the regiment. And in action, the senior surgeon and one of the assistants, probably the more junior of the two, would retire to a regimental aid post and then to perhaps a, a battalion or brigade hospital, whilst the more senior assistant surgeon would go into line along with the troops to provide first aid. So that every battalion of between five and 800 men would carry three surgeons, that is till after 1795 at any rate. There were staff surgeons that worked in hospitals and the nurses were sporadically employed in the wards. There were ward masters, purveyors and apothecaries in the army medical department. And of course, separately was the Ordnance Medical Corps, which was a very good department, which became enveloped by the army medical department in about 1853. So the Napoleonic Wars afforded a great opportunity for appropriate training for a department that needed development, needed militarization, and needed vigor and understanding of crude military medicine and surgery as it was then. Because remember, we are 40 years before general anesthetic was used on the battlefield and 50 years before the introduction of antiseptic surgery, perhaps the greatest uh, invention uh, for the British Army and its civilian counterpart surgeons that we know. We are about to witness a recreation of a capital operation performed a kilometre behind the front line at the Battle of Waterloo in the farm of Mont Saint-Jean, which was the major dressing station for the British Army and her allies. The victim is Corporal Eels of Captain Harty's company of His Majesty's 33rd West Riding Regiment of Foot, who has been hit in the left knee and sustained a compound injury of his knee joint from a French musket ball. He'll be helped the kilometre or so from the front line into the hospital where uh, surgical treatment will be sought. Surgeon will be with you in a minute, mate. Oh, he's coming, he's just dealing with somebody else. Have another drink of water. Come on, let's get you up. Uh. Stop now the patient has to be prepared for surgery. This is going to be heroic stuff. It's going to be difficult for the surgeon and very unpleasant for the patient. The operation is going to last about 20 minutes, but first he must assess whether amputation should be necessary. And to do this, he will introduce a finger into the knee via the musket ball injury, retrieve the ball if he can, feel the amount of damage done to the joint, and if the joint is significantly damaged, the leg will have to be removed. The patient will be sat upright, which is the normal way of surgery in these days. This was for ergonomic reasons, to make the surgery simpler in position for the surgeon himself. Uh, the operation will last about 20 minutes. The limb will be removed in two or three, and uh, so it's a fairly speedy procedure. The patient will have to be told what's to be done and perhaps warned that the skin incision is the most painful part of the operation. No alcohol has been given. There is no other preparation but stoicism for this operation. Right, Sergeant, what have we got here? Walking wounded, sir, came in about half an hour ago. Bullet wound to the knee. We applied tourniquet about half an hour ago. We cleaned up the wound. Very good. Uh, he's ready for your examination, sir. He says he can't feel his leg. 
Yeah, it's not looking Can good. Can you feel lad. the toes, Private? Yeah. There's no pulse. There's no. There's no arterial blood flow to the foot. It's not looking good, lad. It's not uh, looking good. Okay. He's a corporal, so it's Corporal Eels from Hartie's company. Uh, keep still. Keep still. Well done. Well done. Yeah. The knee, the knee joint has suffered severe damage. There's no way I can save the lower leg. Right, Corporal, you'll have to steady yourself. This limb's going to have to come off. Now for the operation itself. Firstly, the skin, fat and superficial muscles have to be divided with one or two sweeps of a curved, semi-curved or almost straight blade. This is called the coup de main by the French. And then the muscles will be divided, if possible sequentially cutting higher and higher to produce an inverted cone so that there's enough soft tissue to be able to be dragged over the bone end after the bone's been divided. The muscle cut is less painful than the skin and having pulled the skin down so that there's enough skin to be used for uh, closure afterwards, the tourniquet must be checked for tightness during this procedure. I want the canteen, please. Please. I'm sorry, Corporal, that's rum. You can't drink rum before a capital operation. Uh, you can maybe have some afterwards, it might do you some good. Uh, right, Corporal, I'll move you over uh, there, please. Mind your hand, hand. hand. Hold him steady now. Steady, blood. Steady. 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 Keep still. No. Keep still. Keep still. Steady. Steady. Still. Get out of the way. Let go of your hand. And now the soft tissues have been divided by a sharp capital knife, it remains to divide the bone before the limb can be removed. This is probably the most difficult part of the operation, and the sawing motion is awkward and difficult for both surgeon and patient, and painful indeed. The soft tissues are retracted with a split linen retractor, although others made of leather or tin can be, could have been used and then the bone is sawn straight through as neatly as possible to avoid splintering. This entails the assistant holding it firmly. Uh, when the limb has been removed, it will be uh, taken away to some place and buried in a waste pit, and now the surgeon must address the amputation site. The surgeon is now inspecting the uh, wound face. Uh, this guillotine amputation has produced a section bone, a large flat area, circular flat area of muscle, and a skin flap which has been cut more superficially and drawn up. These will be dragged over the end of the bone, which is often not an easy process. And in this case, rather than close the wound awkwardly under tension, the surgeon has opted to put a pad over the face after taking up the arteries with a tenaculum and tying them with a silk or linen ligature. These are firmly tied. The tourniquet will be momentarily released to see if there's any bleeding vessel that's been unattended. And then the face of the wound is sponged and a pad placed over it, followed by the application of a Malta cross dressing and a, a linen roller bandage around it. Uh. 
Well done, Private. Okay, here we go again. Sponge the wound. Steady, 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 corporal. Steady. Doing well. The wound looks clean and dry. We can uh, return the skin now. Slowly does it. That's good. Good, good. Okay, we're nearly there. Right, Corporal, we're nearly finished. Corporal Eels has now had his legs successfully removed. There's a significant chance of infection, but hopefully not and the overall mortality of amputations at this time with a decent surgeon and a reasonably fit patient is about 20%. He will be taken off to be lain down in the yard and be given perhaps a cordial or a dose or two of tincture of opium or laudanum. In the future, he will have six to eight weeks of severe pain as his wound heals. If he's lucky, Chelsea or Kil Kilmainan Hospital will supply him with an artificial limb and he'll be given a pension of around 10 pence a day. His greatest badge of heroism, apart from the Waterloo Medal that he will receive, will be the loss of his leg, for which all will respect him for the rest of his days. A great price to pay. He's one of the 55,000 men killed or wounded on the field of Waterloo on that day. <laughs> <laughs>